live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Samsung Developer Conference 2017. Brought to you by Samsung. Okay, we're back here live in San Francisco at Moscone West for exclusive coverage of Samsung Developer Conference. I'm John Furrier, the co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media and the host of theCUBE here. Our next guest is Mary Min, Vice President of Global uh, Business Development at SE Works Inc. Uh, former uh, entrepreneur, gamer, still entrepreneurial in, in her new world, but has seen the evolution of gaming. Here to talk about augmented reality, virtual reality, and kind of the trajectory of life in the digital era. Welcome to theCUBE. Okay, thank you. So we were just talking before we came on about the evolution of your career. You had a startup, you sold it, it was a game, and you've been gaming it since the late 90s and, and looking forward. Um, what is the evolution of gaming and how it relates to augmented reality? Because there's a debate that goes on in the industry. Oh, VR is the next big thing, but it, yet it failed. Tim Cook recently came out and said, hey, you know, don't get your hopes up. There's still more headroom to do. Not necessarily a bad thing, because now augmented reality is winning. You're mm -hmm. seeing it in industrial IoT, you're seeing augmented reality. So what's your thoughts about how people should think about the evolution of this new wave of innovation? I think that with any new technology that's really life-changing for society as a whole, nothing ever gets done on the first iteration or the first phase. Things um, will never really take off on the first round, especially when you're going mass consumer because people need time for learned behavior. People are creatures of habit. They like to stick with what's familiar. And in order for them to move from one leap to the next, you need baby steps. And those baby steps, unfortunately, will include pioneers in whatever field, whether it be AR or VR, that need to blaze the trail for their successors to come and start building on top of that as well. Um, I read something really interesting this morning coming here where if you have someone who's trying to dig a well and you need to dig 10 feet, the first person fails because they only dug the first foot. Second person, third person, subsequently until the ninth person, that well is not dug. But that 10th person is who successfully has the water filling the well. That 10th person could not have dug that final last foot if the first nine didn't go before him. And I consider that's really the phase that VR and AR are on as well. Uh, we needed that first iteration of VR in order to have the, next, the new generation of engineers, entrepreneurs, product people, uh, mindset people to start thinking about how to shape the future of this ecosystem. And we needed that to have its course in order for AR to build on top of those learnings. And hopefully as we subsequently start to build on those as well, we don't view this as failures mm -hmm. necessarily, but as necessary advancements in order to get to the ultimate goal of integrating more technology into our lives to make it a better life. Yeah. And in the relationship between the hardware platforms whether it's console, PC, handset, or headset, and software is interesting. Um, and I want to talk about that with you, but, but first I want to tell your story. Tell about your um, entrepreneurial story. You were at um, UC Berkeley, Cal, here, um, University of California in Berkeley. Uh, my daughter's junior there, but great school, doing a lot of cutting edge stuff there at Berkeley, and certainly not in lack of protests either these days. <laughs> but tell us the story. You dropped out and started a company. Tell the story. Uh, so I was attending Berkeley and I'm very grateful that I was able to go to Cal, particularly because I grew up in Southern California, where around the time that I grew up there really wasn't a lot of startups or entrepreneurial minded people. And I came up here and became really immersed in tech and that was my first foray into it. And during college I was working at a gaming company to help support myself through school and just really fell in love with it and decided that was truly what I wanted to do. My parents supported my decision and so with their help and approval, um, I started building games and I've been building games since, again, the mid to late 90s until now. Um, 
ran a couple of companies, um, founded a few of them, and the latest one that I founded was a few years ago called Second Wave Games. Uh, we had sold it to a larger company called World Golf Tour, and here I am now uh, building tools for game developers, actually. And what an evolution, go back, I mean, the Nokia phones, you know, and then the iPhone hit the scene, you got smartphones, so everything in between has been a balance of being creative with software and, and art, if you will, gaming is art. Um, what has changed, I mean, what, I mean obviously, Things fail because it's a content business, content is games, so there's always that symbiotic relationship between hardware and software. <laughs> who pushes who? Is it, the, is it the yin and the yang, or is it the good and, good and the bad? What's going on between the relationship these days? Because we certainly see it on the enterprise side. Mm -hmm. um, software at the edge is driving infrastructure. What's the relationship in, from the content, from the art, artistry standpoint, and the handset? Now from our point, Content makers are not very interested in any platform or hardware that doesn't have the distribution, but the hardware manufacturers need the content in order to push the distribution of hardware, so it becomes a chicken and the egg problem, and it really depends on the approach that people will take. The content distributors do not own the platform, they don't own the distribution of the actual devices that will run things, so it really is kind of falls on the hardware manufacturers to decide what path they will go down. Yeah. Um, you know, we will see more aggressive things like uh, Microsoft when they first launched uh, the Xbox, for example, uh, they took a heavy loss on every unit that they sold, but they were focused primarily on distribution. And then they hit on this magic, you know, very, very like, uh, really, really runaway hit called Halo. Yeah. You like Halo, you have to play on Xbox. It's not available on the other console. And Call of Duty right after it. Call of Duty list, right after the list it. list is endless. Right, and so that becomes a really excellent example of how content drives adaptation of hardware because if you are huge fans yeah. of this title, you have to go to this hardware and there's no other argument about it. It's interesting, the, the evolution of the internet, early adopters you saw, it's kind of like, the adult industry you know, was, was a leading indicator of kind of the trends in online advertising. That's a big joke in the industry. Now, um, you know, you're seeing the leading indicators in terms of cutting edge pioneer blaze trailers is gaming. Mm -hmm. Virtual communities, virtual currencies. The gaming culture, you can almost use as a precursor to what you're seeing on the crypto side with, with blockchain. You can see on the augmented reality, that's a gamification of life where now the content is the real world. Yeah. So how are that, that's a super exciting for someone who's been in the gaming area. And software developers got to be sitting there licking their, licking their chops saying, hey, I want to get in on this. So Your thoughts. At my current company, um, SE Works, when we started developing our solution, we actually tested it first and foremost with gaming with gaming apps above everything else, and people were a little puzzled thinking, why would you test gaming above finance or healthcare or IOT? And our answer is because gaming is the most complex thing anyone can possibly make. It contains pretty much every single piece of technology that you can ever know. There are communications layers, there have the most sophisticated graphics layers, they have intense AI layers, they have intense algorithms, anything calculated, and it is in itself an inherent small economical ecosystem as well. So it is a very complex mini world that you're building inside of the constraints of one application, which then has to be very sophisticated in technology in order to run on our current set of hardware and devices. So it's the most challenging thing that we could build for and that's why we chose it. And I see the same thing happening Gaming is life and life is games, right? Outside of solving your very basic human needs of shelter, food, and sleep, clothing, uh, what's the immediate next thing that you want to do? People want to be entertained, you know, in some format or another, and games are really just almost like a primal urge and an instinct. Yeah, yeah and you're seeing the intersection of e-commerce, entertainment, and web services mm -hmm. or cloud which you can bundle in, you know, IOT, all intersecting. And that's really what the real world is. I mean, analog digital coming together is the consumerization of, you know, physical and digital, which Samsung's putting out there. And this is the perfect beginning wave coming. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you agree? I think so. You know, as I was sitting through the keynote today and I'm just reflecting on 
the future where I can watch TV and there's this beautiful scene of a local inn in Northern California, then I say, I want to go. And I jump in my car and the destination is magically loaded on my GPS and my, in my very smart car and it just takes me there and I don't have to think about it and on the way they've already made reservations, yeah. right? <laughs> uh, it seems like a very seamless yeah. integration of everything if it's ideally done and part of me, I think the security paranoia yeah. in me is also a little afraid yeah. that too much information is going to be not necessarily a good thing yeah. in a lot of senses um, because what we see and what I've seen in almost 20 years of tech is every time we rush to new technology, new platforms, new distribution, uh, methodologies, people rush in and make the same mistakes over and over again. So I am a little afraid that with yeah. this era, it's going to be exactly the same, where we see yeah. explosion of growth, we see ex explosion of content, people coming in with a gold rush, and then a few years later, when things are established, yeah. we're going to start to see the security leaks, the data leaks, yeah. the breaches. It's kind of like you don't know that smoking's bad for you until they realize people die of lung cancer. It's like data is the same thing. You don't know how much privacy you have given up well, I mean, look at Equifax, there's going to be more of those. So I think, you know, permissionless, permission-based, data security, huge issue. Uh -huh. That's big. It is, uh, particularly because your average consumer is not very privacy sensitive. You know, if I want to use something, I want to use something. If asking me for permissions is just a hurdle that if I'm motivated enough to actually use a service or use an app, I'm just going to keep brushing aside without really thinking about it. And alarmingly, you know, the number of apps that we look at, the number of permissions that they ask is kind of scary. Mary, great to have you on theCUBE. Great conversation, great thought leadership. I'll give you the final word. What are you guys doing at SE Works? What are you up to after the event? What are some of the things you're working on? Get the plug in for your uh, company. Yes, so what SE Works does is we do tools for developers to help you alleviate your security needs when you're developing for mobile apps or for IoT or for connected anything, actually. If you're building on Android or iOS, we have a solution for you. We're essentially like your armory, so we outfit you with an incredible shield that protects your application when it ships to the public um, against hacking and so reverse security engineering. security as a service. Where kind security as a service, um, just think of us as your on-call hackers. <laughs> How's that? Great, your white hat shield for the apps, exactly. for mobile, mobile development's hot, obviously. New user experiences and expectations are here. There's a big wave coming in. We're seeing with machine learning, you're seeing with AI, and certainly augmented reality and virtual reality, all powered by unlimited computer in the cloud, Mary Min from SE Works. The Cube, more live coverage here in San Francisco after this short break.